Okay. All right, now I can hear myself. You all got can hear me, heard me before I could hear myself. That was a little bit weird. Okay, so we're doing it rough and ready tonight. Pulling everything together at the last minute, figuring things out. Um, I don't plan to unveil any dramatically new stuff tonight on my ideas about truth, belief, and critical thinking, but I was getting some feedback from my wife about how things were uh, two weeks ago, and she says she lost her attention. <laughs> I lost her attention after I started, uh, after I finished my map analogy about truth. So that tells me that I should probably pick up and do a little more focus on the last third of what I talked about two weeks ago. Uh, in the meantime, if you tuned in last week, uh, which if you didn't, you should definitely watch the recording of, Eric gave a more full exegesis, a more full look at the scripture of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. And he was very impressed with the fact that what, <laughs> what I said the verse meant two weeks ago might lined up with what actually he read. And I was very happy with that because I was a little nervous about pulling a verse out of its larger context and using it. Um, so I'm happy to hear that Eric agrees with me that it was in fact what the Apostle Paul and Timothy are saying to the church at Corinth. Yes, you should take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. And that is the core of what Eric and I are agreement about, um, the core of what we take to be critical thinking from within a Christian perspective. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that by way of an analogy. Um, and then I'm going to move on to another analogy that I was inspired by Sue, or I'm just outright stealing it from Sue after hearing about it on Sunday night. Okay, so, but I'm going to start there. And I'm going to start with one of my wonderful circles, but I need a, a, an eraser. Maybe I'll just use my hand in the meantime. Okay. All right. Okay, so two weeks ago, I started by drawing a circle and saying that there's represented your mind. Did you lose me for a sec? No? Okay, just turned me down. All right. Um, and I was saying all kinds of thoughts are constantly kind of coming in from outside and maybe just popping up out of nowhere <laughs> or seemingly. These are meant to represent thoughts. I guess I'll make them all little teeny tiny little circle things. Okay, all right. Coming in from outside, but also kind of popping up from in, within yourself. Maybe uh, from your internal sensations, your external sensations, what you see, what you hear, um, what you feel, um, what you remember, all these different sources of thoughts. And uh, some of them we take into our circle of belief. And my definition of a belief from two weeks ago is that a belief is a thought that you have accepted. So you have an attitude towards that thought, which is one of confidence or trust or agreement or something like that. You have some kind of positive, trusting attitude towards that thought. And that's what makes it a belief. So here's one right next to, in my drawing, just ended up right there in the circle of belief. Okay, and then I introduced this idea of core beliefs Because I think a key part of what we do when we're thinking critically is that we're using our core beliefs as, uh, now what do I want to do? Maybe use a giant. Okay, so we take it, 
and we're going to make it into like a a magnifying glass. <laughs> okay. You have to imagine that's a magnifying glass. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So our core beliefs, we, we use our core beliefs to, as a magnifying glass, <laughs> to look at these other beliefs. Um, and that's how we do this process of thinking critically. Uh, I think really we do this process kind of automatically anyway, no matter what. But my encouragement to us as a church is to start to think about more consciously with more conscious control, with some more willfulness, some chosen aspect of ourselves to see that we're doing this and to try to do it um, more and try to do it better. So some of the things that we're using in our core beliefs that I was encouraging us to rely upon are statements that we like deeply, deeply trust about Jesus and God, the Holy Spirit, um, the truths that we see in the Bible about human beings and our relationship with God, how the world is, uh, what kinds of things exist out in the world and the testimony that we get from the church throughout history and our immediate community here in the village church. So we want those things to be the things that filter out, examine all the other thoughts that come our way. Okay, so I was trying to think of this aspect that I think I didn't really talk about much. But so... One, one analogy that's good to use is this core beliefs as a kind of a magnifying glass on all these other beliefs. But I wanted something that illustrated really well, was really tightly linked to the passage in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, which is taking captive thoughts. And I recognized right away that a good analogy would be quarantine. Okay because we all know what that's like right now. We're all in the midst of this pandemic. We're putting people in quarantine. We're putting ourselves in quarantine. We're putting objects at times in quarantine, at least really early on. I remember hearing stories of people like spraying down their mail with uh, disinfectant, stuff like that. Okay, that's maybe a little, a little crazy at this point, given what we know about what the virus does or how it works. But in any case... We have this idea of putting things in quarantine. So I'm going to draw a box here. Okay. I think one of the ways that we can try to do critical thinking and taking our th thoughts cop captive is to try to create a space in our mind like a quarantine box or room or wing of a hospital or however you want to kind of imagine this. And I think it is useful to use your imagination here when you're sifting through your thoughts. Um, there's, there's actually really good meditative techniques, many of which come from Christians over periods of history um, about how to imagine things that are helpful to our spiritual life that we're trying to lead in putting Jesus at the center and listening to him and then doing as he commands us. So Paul is saying, hey, what we need to do is we need to put thoughts in quarantine. We need to take them captive. So here we have a thought. It's an unhappy thought. Okay. <laughs> They're in quarantine. All right. Uh, but the reason we're putting things into quarantine, and this is the reason I really like this analogy, is that we don't know if the thoughts are safe for us or not. So that's, that's the analogy here. We, we don't automatically know whether a thought is true at first. So suppose I want to watch the news, even though I encouraged you two weeks ago to maybe consume less news. So, I mean, a good strategy of critical thinking that can be helpful to you is just to cut down on the, the many, many things that are constantly assaulting your mind. Just minimum, you know, cut that down. Reduce the number of those things. 
So that's one thing. But suppose you do want to listen to a source of information. And there are many sources of information and not all of them um, should be listened to uncritically. Like you shouldn't just go in wanting to believe or expecting to believe everything that you're told from a certain source out there. So you want to create this space in your mind where you're thinking about these things, but you're not letting them into your beliefs. In fact, you're, you're trying not to even let them run wild over the space of your mind in general. You want them right there in that, like, that nice box. Right? Maybe it's got like a, a door with a window or something. I don't know. <laughs> Use your imagination. My drawings are not going to be necessarily fantastic on this. But that's the basic idea is that you want to create this space in your mind where you can consider things, use your core beliefs to look at them more closely, to filter them, to decide whether you think that they're true or not before you let them kind of run riled all over your, your mind. And I think for some of us who tend to have, I don't know, bouncing, intrusive thoughts, maybe it would just be good to organize our thoughts and, and, and start to be thinking imaginatively uh, about our thoughts in a way that we're kind of putting them in a box where they're contained and, and they're ordered and we know why they're there, right? We're looking at them, we're considering them. So it's good to consider our thoughts and decide whether we think they're true or not before believing them. I think that's a great practice and I think it's in line with what Apostle, the Apostle Paul is talking about, putting our thoughts captive, okay? So, I mean, the reason, the, the analogy of the quarantine kind of breaks down because, I mean, I have, unless you somehow like put Jesus in, like as a, a, I'm now I'm imagining Jesus in like a lab coat, you know, with a, like a mask and like he's there, like helping do the tests about whether the patient is sick. I don't know. I guess it can work, but we're supposed to be laying these thoughts before the feet of Jesus, right? And the, the imagery as Eric said last week is actually pretty darn warlike and vi violent from Paul. Um, I kind of like that mine's a little more <laughs> science medicine like, uh, but in any case, it's not just that you by yourself are putting them in quarantine, right? We're doing this with the help of Jesus on Jesus's behalf. It is for our good, but we're doing it with him. Okay, so this is not just completely up to us. Which is great, because the other thing that I wanted to talk about uh, goes back to this idea of core beliefs. So I'm going to erase my picture of the thought jail, quarantine, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the thought box. Okay. Well, some of these lines are just going to get in the way, so I'm going to have to redraw them. I got some really excellent feedback from some random people I know on the internet about my last. <laughs> so one of the questions I got, which a bigger circle. Bigger circle. Ah, okay, all right. So my technical team, this director of cinematography, Eric Seepin says, <laughs> Bigger circle, please. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So the outer... The outer section of the circle is where thoughts are, the inner, inner circle, uh, the second tiers, beliefs, and I don't mean to say that there are only these tiers of things. I think I said two weeks ago that we can have different kind of amounts of confidence in our beliefs. And that's really the idea I'm getting to with core beliefs, is that core beliefs are ones that we hold on to extremely tightly. And this is the next thing that I want to address. And I, and I said two weeks ago some things about this, but I mean, it was towards the end of the time. It's going on like 9.20, people getting sleepy, you, you know, so on and so forth. All right. So there are reasons why this is difficult. On top of it just being plain difficult. And 
I got some great questions and comments about this, like I said, from some random people on the internet. Um, well, they're not completely random. I c kind of sort of know them. And one of, it, one of the questions basically was like, what do you do when your core beliefs are false? All right. So there's this idea in psychology called cognitive dif dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. And basically, it's about the kind of psychological pain and anguish that you experience when uh, there's a mismatch between what you hold to be true and some other idea that you realize is also true, but they stand in contradiction to each other. Okay. So where you have two ideas, both of which you think are true, but they, you can't hold them both at the same time comfortably. That is called cognitive dissonance to psychologists. And what we tend to do when we're confronted with this situation is to try to resolve that tension as quickly as possible because it's really uncomfortable to have that happening. So um, what we would like to be the case is that all our core beliefs are exactly 100% true, none of them are false, and they're about all the important things that we need to know about ourselves, about God, about the world, about other people. And we're using that cognitive dissonance in a filtering mechanism like I just talked about to, to bounce all the other thoughts that don't belong outside of our mind, right? It's kind of like the bouncer at a business or a club or something or whatever. It's just like, get out of here. You don't belong, okay? But... We're in the very unfortunate and messy situation of having many of even our core beliefs, well, I don't know if I want to say many, but at least some of our core beliefs even being false. And sorting through which of them are true and which of them are false is really, one, painful and, and discomforting. Like I just said, it, it is going to create this psychological pain called psycho uh, cognitive dis dissonance. And we really, really don't like it. In fact, people would do all kinds of ridiculous things to get out of a situation like that. <laughs> um, I'm sure I could talk more with Eric about some of those ridiculous examples. I didn't really look up too many. But we do, in fact, have a way of dealing with this at the church. Um, and it's called the hot seat model or the table of decision. Like that's actually why the hot seat model was created is to give us um, a practical way for us as a community, in love, try to speak truth to each other and sort through our core beliefs, some of which might be false. Um, I'll give you an example to try and make this a little more concrete. Okay, so one example of a false belief that might be really tightly held onto by a person, and I know I come across this in myself and with other people that I've gone and done the hot seat with in Pilgrim Group before, is this idea that God is not in control. Okay, So that's a belief that I know many of us tightly hold on to. Is that God is not actually in control of my life and how it's going. He's not in control of the world. There's another one. It's kind of closely related. God does not care about me. Okay, so I think both of these things are false. In fact, we would call them lies because we ultimately think that they're sourced from the devil, okay, so from Satan, that he would like no, for nothing else than for us to be filled to the brim in the interior of our mind, in the depths of our heart with things that are actually not true about God and are going to lead us astray and are going to lead us to further pain um, and difficulty and out of relationship with God. So out of that belief, I might come to form another belief. Maybe it's part of my core beliefs too, but maybe not. But I think for a lot of people that I work with, another core belief is tightly associated with that false belief is then comes the idea that it is up to me to take control in my life and to exact justice, right? To uh, get the revenge or to get the justice that I'm owed, and then, and then we're like, wow, I was just insanely angry at this moment. Where did that come from? 
right? So then we try to process it through the hot seat and we oftentimes find lying behind it in the set of our core beliefs that, we've, that we navigate the entire rest of the world with, right? It's the, it's the centerpiece of our map of how the world actually is. This fact, supposed fact, which is not actually true, that God is not sovereign, God is not in control, God is not reigning and Lord of the world and our lives, or just doesn't care. And then I have to be the brave, strong person who does what God can't do or won't do for myself. Okay, so the hot seat model directly addresses this. I'm not going to break down for you the hot seat model tonight, but I encourage you to go find out more about the hot seat model within our church because I think it is crucial to sorting through this process. Um, And I want to use Sue's analogy from Sunday, okay? So our core beliefs are really tightly cherished by us. It's as if they are like our favorite stuffed animals, okay? So maybe I can make like a, some, (laughs) some, (laughs) that's like a cat or a bunny and maybe like a, A teddy bear, okay, I don't know. All right, so these are, (laughs) yay, don't worry. The drawings are terrible. You don't need to see them anyway. Okay, but I just want to imagine to you, actually my my sisters and I had two, I have two younger sisters. My sisters and I were really into stuffed animals, especially before like the age of eight or 10 or whatever, like when we were young. Our stuffed animal collection was extremely important to us and had all kinds of, vast significance and meaning. And we just really cherish these things. They're extremely special to us. Our core beliefs are like that, even when they're false, okay? So this is how difficult it is. Like, it's as if your favorite teddy bear is betraying you, right? That's as if it feels, right? Like, it's as if your mom says, this teddy bear is old and disgusting and it's making you sick, I have to throw it out, right? Just imagine five-year-old self, right? Confronted with your mom who's like, This bear has got to go, right? It's full of germs. You've been sick like three times in the past month, right? And you're like, no, right? Like it's making you sick, but you don't care. It's your favorite teddy bear, right? It's your favorite. It's like that, okay? So that, if you want to kind of picture of what cognitive dissonance and examining your core beliefs feels like, it's as if the little kid is having your favorite, you know, his or her favorite stuffed animals, you know, scrutinized <laughs> and threatened. All right. Uh, I think that's pretty close to me wrapping up tonight, okay? So I just want to go over the two analogies, okay? Our favorite stuffed animals are under threat. That's how it feels like when our core beliefs are being examined. And so we need, we desperately need people who we can rely on as loving, caring, considerate, to be surrounded by us, okay? Um, And to be praying for us in the moment, um, outside of the moment, demonstrating that they, these people truly care about us and they're not just, you know, taking away our teddy bears for no good reason. Um, That's the only way the hot seat model really works is if you have a loving community around you uh, of Christ followers who you can trust. I don't think this operation really works otherwise. I don't recommend trying to do it by yourself, and I don't recommend trying to do it to other people who are unwilling and don't have trust in you. Okay? We need to realize that that's how painful it is to other people, for other people, when we try to do the hot seat model. And I am, for one, guilty of not remembering that when I'm confronted with other people's false beliefs. Because I just, I don't know. One of my, my maybe false beliefs is that every falsehood needs to be loudly and violently pointed out, especially in other people, but not myself, right? Okay. <laughs> so, be kind, be loving. That doesn't mean state things that are false or shy away from falsity, but it does mean always operate out of love and in love with the help of the Spirit. And then the other analogy, which I'll put back on the board, is of quarantine 
this quarantine room in our mind, right? It has a nice safe, you know, plexiglass window or whatever that we can look in on some thoughts that we're not sure are true or false and we'd like to examine. And just try, try with the discipline of renewing our mind in Jesus, in the church, in love, to be transformed and not be just unfiltered taking in the beliefs and information of our culture, but to actually think about, huh, is that true? Right? Does that agree with the Bible? Right? If not, maybe it's best that it doesn't stay in my mind or that I keep it at least outside of my beliefs. Right? Keep it on the periphery or keep it in the box where I can consider it and say, hey, you know, I recognize this. This is people, people are saying this, but I don't need to believe it. All right, um, I'm going to end in prayer. Lord Jesus, please send your spirit to help us as we seek to take captive our thoughts and place them before you. Help us to build space in our mind to do that. Help us to reach out to others in love and only in love when we're helping them to sort through their core beliefs. Pray for a massive amount of grace in our community. And despite the fact that we are really happy with some of the things that we built, like the hot seat model, I pray that you take a hold of that with your spirit and use it for good things and to blunt aside even my own ham-fisted attempts to do that correctly. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.